Selamat datang di latihan listening. Belajar mendengarkan bahasa Inggris dalam cerita singkat. Once upon a time, in a far-off country, there lived a merchant who was enormously rich. He had six sons and six daughters, however, who were accustomed to having everything they fancied, and he did not find he had a penny too much. But a series of misfortunes befell them. One day their house caught fire and speedily burned to the ground, with all the splendid furniture, books, pictures, gold, silver, and precious goods it contained. Then the father suddenly lost every ship he had upon the sea because of pirates, shipwreck, or fire. As though that were not enough, he heard that his clerks in distant countries, whom he had trusted, had proved dishonest, and at last from great wealth he fell into the direst poverty. All that he had left was a little house in a desolate place a long distance from the town. The daughters at first hoped their friends, who had been so numerous while they were rich, would insist that they stay in their houses. But they soon found they were left alone. These former friends even attributed the family's misfortunes to the daughter's extravagance and showed no intention of offering any help. So nothing was left for them but to take their departure to the cottage, which stood in the midst of a dark forest. They were too poor to have any servants, and the girls had to work hard. The sons, for their part, cultivated the fields to earn their living. Roughly clothed and living in the simplest way, the girls never ceased to yearn for the luxuries and amusements of their former life. Only the youngest daughter tried to be brave and cheerful. She had been as sad as anyone when misfortune first overtook her father, but soon recovered her natural gaiety. She set to work to make the best of things, to amuse her father and brothers as well as she could, and to persuade her sisters to join her in dancing and singing. But they would do nothing of the sort, and, because she was not as gloomy as themselves, they declared their miserable life was all she was fit for. But she was really far prettier and cleverer than they were. Indeed, she was so lovely, she was always called Beauty. After two years, their father received news that one of his ships, which he had believed lost, had come safely into port with a rich cargo. All the sons and daughters at once thought that their poverty was at an end and wanted to set out directly for the town, but their father, who was more prudent, begged them to wait a little. Only the youngest daughter had any doubt but that they would soon again be as rich as they were before. They all loaded their father with demands for jewels and dresses which it would have taken a fortune to buy. Only Beauty did not ask for anything. Her father, noticing her silence, said, And what shall I bring for you, Beauty? The one thing I wish for is to see you come home safely, she answered. But this reply annoyed her sisters, who fancied she was blaming them for having asked for such costly things. Her father, however, was pleased, and he urged her to choose something. Well, dear father, she said, as you insist upon it, I beg that you will bring me a rose. I have not seen one since we came here, and I love them so much. The merchant set out only to find that his former companions, believing him to be dead, had divided his cargo among themselves. After six months of trouble and expense, he found himself as poor as when he started on his journey. To make matters worse, he returned during a terrible snowstorm. By the time he was within a few miles of his home, he was almost exhausted with cold and fatigue. Though he knew it would take some hours to get through the forest, he resolved to go on. But night overtook him, and the deep snow and bitter frost made it impossible for his horse to carry him any farther. The only shelter he could find was the hollow trunk of a great tree and there he crouched all night. The howling of the wolves kept him awake, and when at last day broke, the falling snow had covered every path, and he did not know which way to turn. At length he made out some sort of way, but it was so rough and slippery that he fell more than once. Presently it led him into an avenue of orange trees which ended in a splendid castle. 
It seemed to the merchant very strange that no snow had fallen in the avenue of trees, which were covered with flowers and fruit. When he reached the first courtyard, he saw before him a flight of a gate steps. He went up and passed through several splendidly furnished rooms. The pleasant warmth of the air revived him, and he felt very hungry. But there seemed to be nobody in all this vast and splendid palace. Deep silence reigned everywhere, and at last, tired of roaming through empty rooms and galleries, he stopped in a room smaller than the rest. Where a cheerful fire was burning and a couch was drawn up before it, thinking this must be prepared for someone who was expected, he sat down to wait till he should come, and very soon fell into a sweet sleep. When extreme hunger wakened him after several hours, he was still alone, but a little table with a good dinner on it had been drawn up close to him. He lost no time in beginning his meal, hoping he might soon thank his considerate host, whoever he might be. But no one appeared, and even after another long sleep, from which he awoke completely refreshed, there was no sign of anybody, though a fresh meal of dainty cakes and fruit was on the little table at his elbow. Being naturally timid, he grew terrified of the silence, and he resolved to search once more through all the rooms. But it was no use; there was no sign of life in the palace. Then he went down into the garden. And though it was summer everywhere else, here the sun shone, the birds sang, the flowers bloomed, and the air was soft and sweet. The merchant, in ecstasies at all he saw and heard, said to himself, "All this must be meant for me. I will go this minute and bring my children to share all these delights." In spite of being so cold and weary, when he reached the castle. He had taken his horse to the stable and fed it. Now he thought he would saddle it for his homeward journey and turn down the path which led to the stable. This path had a hedge of roses on each side of it, and the merchant thought he had never seen such exquisite flowers. They reminded him of his promise to Beauty, and he stopped and had just gathered one to take to her when he was startled by a strange noise behind him. Turning around. He saw a frightful beast. Who told you you might gather my roses? cried the beast in a terrible voice. Was it not enough that I sheltered you in my palace and was kind to you? This is the way you show your gratitude by stealing my flowers. But your insolence shall not go unpunished. The merchant, terrified by these furious words, dropped the fatal rose and, throwing himself on his knees, cried, "Pardon me, noble sir." I am truly grateful for your hospitality. It was so magnificent I could not imagine you would be offended by my taking such a little thing as a rose. But the beast's anger was not lessened by his speech. You are very ready with excuses and flattery, he cried, but that will not save you from the death you deserve. Alas, thought the merchant, if my daughter Beauty could only know to what danger her rose has brought me. And in despair, he began to tell the beast all his misfortunes and the reason for his journey, not forgetting to mention Beauty's request. A king's ransom would hardly have procured all that my other daughters asked for, he said. But I thought I might at least take Beauty her rose. I beg you to forgive me, for you see I meant no harm. The beast said in a less furious tone, "I will forgive you on one condition, that you will give me one of your daughters." Ah! cried the merchant, "If I were cruel enough to buy my own life at the expense of one of my children's, what excuse could I invent to bring her here?" None answered the beast. "If she comes at all, she must come willingly. On no other condition will I have her. See if any of them is courageous enough and loves you enough to come and save your life. You seem to be an honest man, so I will trust you to go home." I give you a month to see if any of your daughters will come back with you and stay here, so that you may go free. If none of them is willing, you must come alone, for then you will belong to me. And do not imagine that you can hide from me, for if you fail to keep your word, I will come and fetch you," added the beast grimly. The merchant accepted this proposal. He promised to return at the time appointed, and then, anxious to escape from the presence of the beast. He asked permission to set off at once. 
But the beast answered that he could not go until the next day. Then you will find a horse ready for you, he said. Now go and eat your supper and await my orders. The poor merchant, more dead than alive, went back to his room, where the most delicious supper was already served on the little table drawn up before a blazing fire. But he was too terrified to eat and only tasted a few of the dishes, for fear the beast should be angry if he did not obey his orders. When he had finished, the beast warned him to remember their agreement and to prepare his daughter for exactly what she had to expect. Do not get up tomorrow, he added, until you see the sun rise and hear a golden bell ring. Then you will find your breakfast waiting for you, and the horse you are to ride will be ready in the courtyard. He will also bring you back again when you come with your daughter a month from now. Farewell. Take a rose to beauty and remember your promise. The merchant lay down until dawn. Then, after breakfast, he went to gather Beauty's flower and mounted his horse, which carried him off so swiftly that in an instant he had lost sight of the palace. He was still wrapped in gloomy thoughts when it stopped before the door of his cottage. His sons and daughters, who had been uneasy at his long absence, rushed to meet him, eager to know the result of his journey, which, seeing him mounted upon a splendid horse and wrapped in a rich mantle, they supposed to be favorable. But he hid the truth from them at first, only sadly saying to Beauty as he gave her the rose, Here is what you asked me to bring you. Little you know what it has cost. Presently he told them his adventures from beginning to end, and then they were all very unhappy. The girls lamented loudly over their lost hopes, and the sons declared their father should not return to the terrible castle. But he reminded them he had promised to go back. Then the girls were very angry with Beauty and said it was all her fault. If she had asked for something sensible, this would never have happened. Poor Beauty, much distressed, said to them, I have indeed caused this misfortune, but who could have guessed that to ask for a rose would cause so much misery? But as I did the mischief, it is only just that I should suffer for it. I will therefore go back with my father to keep his promise. At first nobody would hear of it. Her father and brothers, who loved her dearly, declared nothing should make them let her go. But Beauty was firm. As the time drew near, she divided her little possessions among her sisters and said goodbye to everything she loved. When the fatal day came, she and her father both mounted the horse which had brought him back. It seemed to fly rather than gallop but was so smoothly that Beauty was not frightened. Indeed, she would have enjoyed the journey if she had not feared what might happen at the end of it. Her father tried to persuade her to go back home with him, but in vain. While they were riding, the night fell. Then, to their great surprise, splendid fireworks blazed out before them and all the forest was illuminated. They even felt pleasantly warm, though it had been bitterly cold before. They reached the avenue of orange trees and saw that the palace was brilliantly lighted from roof to ground and music sounded softly from the courtyard. The beast must be very hungry, said Beauty, trying to laugh, if he makes all this rejoicing over the arrival of his prey. But in spite of her anxiety, she admired all the wonderful things she saw. When they had dismounted, her father led her to the little room. Here they found a crackling fire and the table spread with a delicious supper. Beauty, who was less frightened now that she had passed through so many rooms and seen nothing of the beast, was quite willing to begin, for her long ride had made her very hungry. But they had hardly finished their meal when the noise of the beast's footsteps was heard approaching, and Beauty clung to her father in terror, which became all the greater when she saw how frightened he was. But when the beast appeared, though she trembled at the sight of him, she made a great effort to hide her horror and faced him respectfully. This evidently pleased the beast. After looking at her, he said, in a tone that might have struck terror into the boldest heart, though he did not seem to be angry, Good evening, old man. Good evening, beauty. The merchant was too terrified to reply, but beauty answered sweetly, Good evening, beast. Have you come willingly? asked the beast. Will you be content to stay here when your father has gone away? 
Beauty answered bravely that she was quite prepared to stay. I am pleased with you, said the beast. You have come of your own accord, so you may remain. As for you, old man, he added, turning to the merchant, at sunrise tomorrow take your departure. When the bell rings, get up quickly and eat your breakfast, and you will find the same horse waiting to take you home. Then turning to Beauty, he said, Take your father into the next room and help him choose gifts for your brothers and sisters. You will find two traveling trunks there. Fill them as full as you can. It is only just that you should send them something very precious as a remembrance. Then he went away. Beauty was beginning to think with great dismay of her father's departure, but they went into the next room and were greatly surprised at the riches they found. There were splendid dresses fit for a queen, and when Beauty opened the chests, she was dazzled by the gorgeous jewels lying in heaps upon every shelf. After choosing a vast quantity for each of her sisters, she opened the last chest and discovered that it was full of gold. I think, father, she said, that as the gold will be more useful to you, we had better take off the other things and fill the trunks with it. So they did this, but the more they put in, the more room there seemed to be, and at last they put back all the jewels and dresses they had taken out, and Beauty even added as many more of the jewels as she could carry. Even then the trunks were not too full, but they were so heavy an elephant could not have carried them. The beast was mocking us, cried the merchant. He pretended to give us all these things knowing that I could not carry them away. Let us wait and see, answered Beauty. I cannot believe he meant to deceive us. All we can do is to fasten them and have them ready. So they did this and returned to the little room where they found breakfast prepared. The merchant ate with a good appetite as the beast's generosity made him believe he might perhaps venture to come back soon and see Beauty. But she felt sure her father was leaving her forever, so she was very sad when the bell rang sharply. They went down into the courtyard where two horses were waiting, one loaded with the two trunks, the other for him to ride. They were pawing the ground in their impatience to start, and the merchant bade Beauty a hasty farewell. As soon as he was mounted, the horses went off at such a pace that she lost sight of him in an instant. Then Beauty began to cry and wandered sadly back to her own room. But she soon found she was very sleepy, and as she had nothing better to do, she lay down and instantly fell asleep. And then she dreamed she was walking by a brook bordered with trees and lamenting her sad fate, when a young prince, handsomer than anyone else she had ever seen, and with a voice that went straight to her heart, came and said to her, Ah, Beauty! You are not so unfortunate as you suppose. Here you will be rewarded for all you have suffered elsewhere. Your every wish shall be gratified. Only try to learn who I am, no matter how I may be disguised, for I love you dearly, and in making me happy you will find your own happiness. Be as true-hearted as you are beautiful, and we shall have nothing left to wish for. What can I do, Prince, to make you happy? said Beauty. Only be grateful, he answered, and do not trust too much with your eyes. Above all, do not desert me until you have saved me from my cruel misery. As her dream continued, she found herself in a room with a stately and beautiful lady, who said to her, Dear Beauty, try not to regret all that you have left behind you. You are destined for a better fate. Only do not let yourself be deceived by appearances. Beauty found her dream so interesting that she was in no hurry to awake, but presently the clock roused her by calling her name softly twelve times. Then she rose and found her dressing table set out with everything she could possibly want, and when she was dressed, she found dinner waiting in the room next to hers. But dinner does not take very long when one is alone and soon she sat down cozily in the corner of a sofa and began to think about the charming prince she had seen in her dream. He said I could make him happy, said Beauty to herself. It seems then that this horrible beast keeps him a prisoner. How can I set him free? I wonder why they both told me not to trust to appearances. But after all, it was only a dream, so why should I trouble myself about it? 
I'd better find something to do to amuse myself. So she began to explore some of the rooms in the palace. The first she entered was lined with mirrors. Beauty saw herself reflected on every side and thought she had never seen such a charming room. Then a bracelet which was hanging from a chandelier caught her eye, and on taking it down she was greatly surprised to find that it held a portrait of her unknown admirer, just as she had seen him in her dream. With great delight she slipped the bracelet on her arm and went on into a gallery of pictures, where she soon found a portrait of the same handsome prince, as large as life and so well painted that as she studied it, he seemed to smile kindly at her. Tearing herself away from the portrait at last, she passed into a room which contained every musical instrument under the sun, and here she amused herself for a long while in trying them. By this time it was growing dusk, and wax candles and diamond and ruby candlesticks lit themselves in every room. Beauty found her supper served just at the time she liked to have it, but she did not see anyone or hear a sound, and though her father had warned her she would be alone, she began to find it rather dull. Presently she heard the beast coming and wondered tremblingly if he meant to eat her now. However, he did not seem at all ferocious and only said gruffly, Good evening, beauty. She answered cheerfully and managed to conceal her terror. The beast asked how she had been amusing herself, and she told him all the rooms she had seen, then he asked if she thought she could be happy in his palace, and Beauty answered that everything was so beautiful she would be very hard to please if she could not be happy. After an hour's talk, Beauty began to think the beast was not nearly so terrible as she had supposed. Then he rose to leave and said in his gruff voice, Do you love me, Beauty? Will you marry me? Oh, what shall I say? cried Beauty, for she was afraid to make the beast angry by refusing. Say yes or no without fear, he replied. Oh no, beast, said Beauty hastily. Since you will not, good night, Beauty, he said. And she answered, good night, beast, very glad to find her refusal had not provoked him. After he was gone, she was very soon in bed and dreaming of her unknown prince. She thought he came and said, ah, Beauty, why are you so unkind to me? I fear I am being fated to be unhappy for many a long day still. Then her dreams changed, but the charming prince figured in them all. When morning came, she decided to amuse herself in the garden. She was astonished to find that every place was familiar to her, and presently she came to the very brook and the myrtle trees where she had first met the prince in her dream. That made her think more than ever that he must be kept a prisoner by the beast. When she was tired, she went back to the palace and found a new room full of materials for every kind of work, ribbons to make into bows and silks to work into flowers. There was also an aviary full of rare birds, which were so tame that they flew to beauty as soon as they saw her and perched upon her shoulders and her head. Pretty little creatures, she said. How I wish your cage was nearer to my room that I might often hear you sing. So saying, she opened a door and found to her delight that it led into her own room, though she had thought it was on the other side of the palace. There were more birds in a room farther on, parrots and cockatoos that could talk, and they greeted Beauty by name. Indeed, she found them so entertaining that she took one or two back to her room, and they talked to her while she was at supper. The beast paid her his usual visit and put to her the same questions he had asked before, and then with a gruff good night he took his departure, and Beauty went to bed to dream of her mysterious prince. The days passed swiftly in different amusements, and after a while Beauty found another strange thing which often pleased her when she was tired of being alone. There was one room which she had not noticed particularly. It was empty except that under each of the windows stood a very comfortable chair. The first time she had looked out of a window, it seemed a black curtain prevented her from seeing anything outside. But the second time she went into the room, she happened to be tired and sat down in one of the chairs. Instantly, the curtain was rolled aside, and a most amusing pantomime was acted before her. There were dances and colored lights, music and pretty dresses, and it was all so gay that beauty was in ecstasies. After that, she tried the other seven windows in turn, 
and there was some new and surprising entertainment to be seen from each of them. So Beauty never could feel lonely anymore. Every evening after supper, the Beast came to see her, and always before saying goodnight, he would ask her in his terrible voice, Beauty, will you marry me? It occurred to Beauty now that she understood him better, that when she said no, Beast, he went away quite sad. Her happy dreams of the handsome young prince soon made her forget the poor beast, and the only thing that disturbed her was being told to distrust appearances, to let her heart guide her, and not her eyes. Think about this as she would, she could not understand. So everything went on for a long time until at last, happy as she was, Beauty began to yearn for the sight of her father and her brothers and sisters. One night, seeing her looking very sad, the beast asked what was the matter. Beauty had quite ceased to be afraid of him. Now she knew he was really gentle in spite of his ferocious looks and his dreadful voice. So she answered that she wished to see her home once more. Upon hearing this, the beast seemed distressed and cried out miserably, Ah, oh, Beauty, have you the heart to desert an unhappy beast like this? What more do you want to make you happy? Is it because you hate me that you want to escape? No, dear beast, answered Beauty softly. I do not hate you, and I should be very sorry never to see you any more. But I long to see my father again. Only let me go for two months, and I promise to come back to you and stay for the rest of my life. The beast, who had been sighing unhappily while she spoke, now replied, I cannot refuse you anything you ask, even though it should cost me my life. Take the four boxes you will find in the room next to your own, and fill them with everything you wish to take with you. But remember your promise, and come back when the two months are over, for if you do not return in good time, you will find your faithful beast dead. You will not need any chariot to bring you back. Only say goodbye to your father and brothers and sisters the night before you come away, and when you have gone to bed, turn this ring around upon your finger and say firmly, I wish to go back to my palace and see my beast again. Good night, beauty. Fear nothing, sleep peacefully, and before long you shall see your family once more. As soon as beauty was alone, she hastened to fill the boxes with all the rare and precious things she saw about her. And only when she was tired of heaping things into them did they seem to be full. Then she went to bed but could hardly sleep for joy. When at last she began to dream of her beloved prince, she was grieved to see him stretched upon a grassy bank, sad and weary and hardly like himself. What's the matter? she cried. But he looked at her reproachfully and said, How can you ask me, cruel one? Are you not leaving me to my death, perhaps? Ah, don't be sorrowful, cried Beauty. I am only going to assure my father that I am safe and happy. I have promised the beast faithfully I will come back, and I know that he would die of grief if I did not keep my word. What would that matter to you? asked the prince. Surely you would not care. Indeed, I should be ungrateful if I did not care for such a kind beast, cried Beauty indignantly. I would die to save him from pain. I assure you it is not his fault he is so ugly. Just then a strange sound woke her. Someone was speaking not very far away. Opening her eyes, she found herself in a room she had never seen before, which was certainly not as splendid as those she had seen in the beast's palace. Where could she be? She rose and dressed hastily, and then saw that the boxes she had packed the night before were all in the room. Suddenly she heard her father's voice and rushed out to greet him joyfully. Her brothers and sisters were astonished at her appearance, for they had never expected to see her again. Beauty asked her father what he thought her strange dreams meant, and why the prince in them constantly begged her not to trust to appearances. After much consideration, he answered, you tell me yourself that the beast, frightful as he is, loves you dearly and deserves your love and gratitude for his gentleness and kindness. I think the prince must mean you to understand that you ought to reward the beast by doing as he wishes you to, in spite of his ugliness. Beauty could not help seeing that this seemed likely. Still, when she thought of her dear prince who was so handsome, she did not feel at all inclined to marry the beast. At any rate, for two months, she need not decide but could enjoy herself with her family. Though they were rich now and lived in a town again and had plenty of acquaintances, Beauty found that nothing amused her very much. 
She often thought of the palace where she was so happy, especially as at home she never once dreamed of her beloved prince, and she felt quite sad without him. And her sister seemed quite used to being without her, and even found her rather in the way. So she would not have been sorry when the two months were over but for her father and brothers. She did not have the courage to say goodbye to them. Every day when she rose she meant to say it at night, and when night came she put it off again until at last she had a dismal dream which helped her to make up her mind. She thought she was wandering in a lonely path in the palace gardens when she heard groans. Running quickly to see what could be the matter, she found the beast stretched out upon his side apparently dying. He reproached her faintly with being the cause of his distress and at the same moment a stately lady appeared and said very gravely, Ah, beauty, see what happens when people do not keep their promises? If you had delayed one day more you would have found him dead. Beauty was so terrified by this dream that the very next evening she said goodbye to her father and her brothers and sisters, and as soon as she was in bed she turned around upon her finger the ring which the beast had given her, and said firmly, I wish to go back to the palace and see my beast again. Then she fell asleep instantly and only woke up to hear the clock saying beauty, beauty, twelve times in its musical voice, which told her she was really in the palace once more. Everything was just as before, and her birds were very glad to see her, but beauty thought she had never known such a long day. She was so anxious to see the beast again that she felt as if supper time would never come. But when it came, no beast appeared. After listening and waiting for a long time, she ran down into the garden to search for him. Up and down the paths and avenues ran poor Beauty calling him. No one answered, and not a trace of him could she find. At last Beauty saw that she was standing opposite the shady path she had seen in her dream. She rushed down it, and sure enough, there was the beast, asleep so Beauty thought. Quite glad to have found him, she ran up and stroked his head, but to her horror he did not move or open his eyes. Oh, he is dead, and it is all my fault, cried Beauty, weeping bitterly. But then looking at him again she fancied he still breathed. Hastily fetching some water from the nearest fountain she sprinkled it over his face, and to her great delight he began to revive. Oh, beast, how you frightened me, she cried. I never knew how much I loved you until just now when I feared I was too late to save your life. Can you really love such an ugly creature as I am? asked the beast faintly. Ah, beauty, you came only just in time. I was dying because I thought you had forgotten your promise. But go back now and rest, and I shall see you again by and by. Beauty, who had half expected he would be angry with her, was reassured by his gentle voice and went back to the palace. And after a while the beast came in to visit her and talked about the time she had spent with her father, asking if she had enjoyed herself and if they had all been glad to see her. Beauty quite enjoyed telling him all that had happened to her. When at last the time came for him to leave, he asked, as he had so often asked before, Beauty, will you marry me? She answered softly, Yes, dear beast. As she spoke, a blaze of light sprang up before the windows of the palace, Fireworks crackled and guns boomed, and across the avenue of orange trees, and letters all made of fireflies, was written, Long live the prince and his bride. Turning to ask the beast what it could all mean, Beauty found he had disappeared, and in his place stood her long-loved prince. At the same time the wheels of a chariot were heard upon the terrace, and two ladies entered the room. One of them, Beauty realized, was the stately lady she had seen in her dreams, the other was so queenly that Beauty hardly knew which to greet first. But the one she recognized said to her companion, Well, my queen, this is Beauty, who has had the courage to rescue your son from the terrible enchantment. They love each other, and only your consent to their marriage is wanting to make them perfectly happy. I consent with all my heart, cried the queen. How can I ever thank you enough, charming girl, for having restored my dear son to his natural form? And then she tenderly embraced Beauty and the Prince, who had meanwhile been greeting the other lady, who was a fairy, and receiving her congratulations. Now, said the fairy to Beauty, 
I suppose you would like me to send for your father and all your brothers and sisters to dance at your wedding? And so she did, and the marriage was celebrated the very next day with the utmost splendor, and Beauty and the Prince lived happily ever after.